Hi everyone, I'm Danielle Langton, and in this video we're going to be talking about the writer Philip Larkin. Specifically, this video is about his poem, High Windows. Uh, Philip Larkin had a lot of popularity, and you can go ahead and say fame, like his name was known in his lifetime as a writer. Um, but if you see in this uh, second bullet point here, so he was a poet, a novelist, but he was also a librarian. And um, that's a little different than some of the other writers I've covered in these videos who were either uh, professionally just writers or uh, sometimes they were also academics as in like they were professors, they had a teaching post, maybe like a, um, a special sort of uh, chair of something that involved uh, them being a writer. So this is a little different because he didn't want to be in the limelight as a writer. Um, this is especially kind of defined uh, when uh, right near the end of his life, it's um, almost the last year of his life in 1984, he's offered the title of being the poet laureate. Um, you know, we've had some other, uh, some other poet laureates in this course that we've mentioned like uh, Tennyson. So it's a, it's a really big deal to be offered that title. You're a sort of, like national treasure for the nation that you represent uh, for specifically poetry. But he turns it down, which is like something almost no one would ever do. He turns it down because he doesn't like that kind of fame. He doesn't like being in the public eye. Um, you can maybe kind of see some of that attitude come across when you read High Windows, because his poetry uh, across his body of poetry, especially in this uh, last collection from 1974, which is also titled, the collection is titled High Windows after this specific poem by the same name. And um, it's described as almost like this air of discontent but it's like relaxed discontent like coming to peace with what you didn't have earlier in life and you can see that in high windows when you're reading the first stanza we have a reflection on seeing the younger people having fun doing whatever they want and then going on to discuss well, they can do whatever they want because they're young they don't have to think about their mortality and think about um going to hell when they die so he brings in religion he brings religion into it and so they're not worried about what the priest will say and all those things you have in italics here going into the middle of the poem they are just living in the moment, which it is, that is like how you live your best life when you're younger. Uh, you're not having to think about your mortality or like the the day to day mundane things like bills and such and cleaning domestic things. Mm -hmm. Now you have this image and it is sort of one of the main themes here representing mortality, we have this slide and it's a combine harvester. You could Google videos of this, but you're probably gonna see like one of those really fancy like 21st century ones on some big farm out in like Nebraska or something somewhere. Um, he's gonna be talking about something a little bit earlier than that. Um, <clears throat> and the main idea here is that it's collecting things that are ready to be harvested. They are ripe. They've gone from budding, coming up out of the ground, and um, now through the phase of ripening, and it's time to collect them. Their time just growing in the earth is done. And so these grains are collected by the combine and basically the way it sorts it from like the other pieces of uh, material it collects is the heavier things, the grains will kind of slide, go down a slide into a little collection bin. And so it's kind of like 
when it's your time to go. Um, something like the Grim Reaper. He he's uh, carrying the same tool that would have been that's used uh, in harvesting, right? So <clears throat> you have the same idea here. There are also interpretations that the slide is not just limited to agriculture, but when you have the mentioning of the bloody birds going down the slide, that this is almost like we we are being taken to the slaughterhouse. Like That's a little more gruesome. I'm not sure about that reading personally, because when we move then into the end of the poem, we have this more spiritually abstract, uh, perhaps even optimistic ending. So you you definitely read maybe a little bit of like old grumpy dude attitude when you're starting out, right? The air of discontent with um, not getting to ha fulfill all those other things you wanted to do in life. And by the way, if you read biographies about Philip Larkin, um, it is described that he didn't get to um, really get to have a uh, fun childhood because he had a very strict father who was the treasurer of Coventry. So that was kind of a big deal. So he had the strict upbringing and he couldn't, you know, like go out and sow his wild oats. So uh, that also probably affected maybe his social skills and that like strong dislike of uh being in the public eye. So anyways, going into the end of this poem, <clears throat> in the end we have the clear blue sky image. And this is sort of like certain times of the year, I feel like this is something you see more of. Uh, specifically, if you were watching this video and you are in the Western Hemisphere, it seems more like in the fall, like in October, uh, which happens to be when I'm teaching this poem in the class as I am recording it. There are these days where the sky is cloud, it's clear, maybe a couple of clouds, but you just have this pristine blueness. It's almost like it's a different shade of blue than it is at other times of the year. And if you just are only looking at that and there are no clouds, there's no other landscape, it's almost like you can't measure the vastness of it. Just like you, you can't measure your own existence. You can't, there's no vertical or horizontal limits, um, no way to see where it ends. Because as, as the final line says, this blueness, this blue sky, it's nothing and is nowhere and it's endless so not only does it just go on forever but somehow simultaneously it's not actually anywhere and it's in fact nothing at all um that, that's also that's a sort of like ancient philosophy uh idea as well the concept of zero that there is never actually nothingness uh, out of nothing. There is always comes something like look at the big bang theory. So it, it couldn't just have the existence of totally nothing that it create it. Something creates something, something out of nothing. And another thing to consider is, um, if you're looking at this blue sky of the high windows, um, we have the glass that is uh, that we are looking out of in these high windows, the sun comprehending glass. That's the one thing that is separating us from that vastness of blue sky. And in some interpretations, this high window is like that of a cathedral. And so like, it's kind of like sometimes you try so hard that you miss the point. So if it's taking place in a cathedral, uh, this worrying about mortality, because remember, he's already mentioned uh, things about religion earlier in the poem. 
And if this is in the end taking place in a cathedral and we are looking out a cathedral window at this endless blue sky, it's sort of like we could almost look at and have our own awareness and acceptance of our lives, of our existence. But sometimes maybe if people try too hard, their religion could hinder them, as Larkin is writing anyways, their religion could hinder them from finding that acceptance because they're like overthinking it. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you for watching.